This is going to be exciting. Ruth, you have a wealth of experience helping cities express themselves through art, whether it be the Olympics, the world saw your work as a culture director, director for the Olympiad 2012, as director of the Holland Festival. Now that you take on this new project in Paris, what is it you hope that Paris can express about itself? What's the opportunity there? And for all the mayors in the room, what is the opportunity to use art to express the city itself? Well, as you've all seen, Paris is a fantastic city and it's a great center of creativity and innovation. And the Théâtre du Châtelet has a really important role in the history of that innovation. Founded in the 19th century, it created, it found a new form for working class ordinary people. And in the 20th century, it had some of the greatest artists in the world, Stravinsky, Picasso, Sarti, Debussy, who came and invented new art forms. So we've got a high bar to reach. But we start with the values of Paris, and we start with the values that we believe in. You'll notice I'm saying we. That's because there are two of us who have come to Châtelet. We're joint chief executives with Thomas Loriot and Yves Prevot, who is here in the audience. And we believe in the first person plural. We believe in the power of teams, of saying we. But most importantly, we believe that since every single person, every citizen of Paris is paying for this theater, every citizen needs to have, has a right to have the chance to develop their creativity and see and work with the greatest artists in the world. You're going to be collaborating with Elizabeth here, and we all saw the Streb that amazing display this morning. But for people who aren't as familiar with Elizabeth's work, she is a MacArthur Genius Grant winner. And according to your bio, it says, you have dived through glass, allowed a ton of dirt to fall on your head, walked down the outside of London City Hall, and set yourself on fire, among <laughs> other feats of extreme action. So I just want you to park that information there as I that, ask this the next question. The fire part was an accident. I just oh, that was an accident. <laughs> a solo gone wrong. <laughs> uh, I was in a session earlier this morning, and someone said that every city should have an artist in residence, and I'm assuming you agree with that. Um, why would that be a good thing? What can that add to a city? Well, the only caveat I would add to that is I, I think that artists um, have a certain weariness with waiting by the phone to be invited, and my only caveat to that would be that I'd want to own my own building, which we do in New York, mm -hmm. it's called SLAM, and I would like to certainly have the support, but I think that I'm a little off the beaten track in terms of waiting for the largesse of, um, of cities. However, um, Kate Levin and certainly Mayor Bloomberg made it possible, and so many others made it possible mm -hmm. for us to own our garage in Williamsburg, Brooklyn. Yeah. So I, I'm not directly asking your question because I want to collaborate with the city and they really believed in the necessity for a permanent space yeah. and not just an artist in residency for a few years. What do you think about this idea of having an artist in residence to help express a city express so, itself? So, of course, I agree with Elizabeth that artists have to go the path they need to go. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's our job to protect and empower the artists. That's our job. But I think it's also our job, if we are taking money from the city, if we are running cultural institutions that belong to the city. It's our job to think also about how we serve the priorities of you mayors and you that are trying to shape the future of those cities. And one of the great things about artists is they are brilliant at telling us about the future. And artists have always been brilliant at helping us to understand problems that maybe we can't understand. Artists can lead us, ordinary people, to see and understand things that we cannot understand. Uh, I mean, one of the great examples of that for me was when we worked together on the London 2012 Festival, where we commissioned Elizabeth to make a project called One Extraordinary Day. I think we have a little Yeah, let's take a look at some of the slides so people can see. Can and One Extraordinary Day, like lots of the projects we did for the London 2012 Olympics, was a once-in-a-lifetime chance but it aimed to show off the city. So here we are in Trafalgar Square, and you can see the dancers you saw this morning, except they're dancing and jumping from much higher up. Here we are on a bridge in the middle of London with St. Paul's Cathedral just, just coming into view. 
There it is, St. Paul's Cathedral and the River Thames below them. But one of the great purposes of this piece, there, there's, a, there's Elizabeth herself is walking down the town hall for the mayor of London, uh, was to show off to the world. Because when you have the Olympic Games, the world watches. And the world, thanks to Elizabeth, got an extraordinary impression of the innovation, of the originality, of the quirkiness, of the great danger, if you like, uh, that we could come up with, the surprise in London. It was a pop-up show, it was completely free, and it carries on living around the world. And interestingly, it was paid for, and this will interest some of you, I hope, by the marketing department of the Mayor of London. Because, in fact, to invest in an artist who had complete artistic freedom, but to show off, have the confidence to see that she would reflect the values of London and show off those values around the world. That was a brilliant opportunity for the London 2012 Festival and for, I think, you and your dancers. Oh, it was the one in a million moments that lasted a year and a year and a half, but I will, we're forever changed with those occupations, not in a bad way. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit, I want to ask you about the practical part of preparing to do all those extraordinary things on that one extraordinary day, and then a little bit about your thought process about what to actually do. Well, we wandered around London for quite a few months, and I picked lots of places. I won't go into the ones that said no, um, but the ones that said yes you saw there, there were seven. And then we went about figuring out with Robin Elias, our rigger, who's actually going to be helping us in uh, London to open the Bloomberg Norman Foster building tomorrow. Mm -hmm. um, and he figured out how to get my dancers on the spokes of the London Eye, very impractical, and slide down the radii at a meter a second, and it was the distance of 200 feet. So as it turned, I mean, I'm, I can't really, you can't quell your heart or your mind mm -hmm. um, after something like that. Because <laughs> what are you going to do after that? And then also jumping off the bridge, we were going, how are you ever going to get off once the quote-unquote dance is over? And Ruth got speedboats on the Thames <laughs> to unhook us. And it, basically, we, we spent a year and a half making prototypes in our action garage slam in New York City, mm -hmm. in Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Brooklyn, to try and figure out how their conditions not 100, 200, 500 feet up, will be exactly the same when they get on those buildings. But um, we had to develop the vocabulary and the techniques, and it took months and months and months and well over a year to not have them freak out when they're 500 feet above the ground on the, on the London Eye. But one of the great values that we share, which was also part of One Extraordinary Day, was the involvement of local young people. And that's yes, a really yes. important part of your vision, always has been. And I think it's really interesting to talk about how such skill and such jeopardy, such incredible things mm. that you do, you open the doors to young people to come along the journey with you. And I know this is something that you're hoping to do in Paris as well, bring along young people to be part of the the reimagining right. of the theatre, and this but is Elizabeth's why you brought Elizabeth in. But I'd love Elizabeth just to talk about how she works with young yes. people, because for a lot of people who saw the incredible feats this morning of her professionals who are highly trained, they might wonder how they could allow their, their children, their nieces, their grandchildren to come and take part. Um, well, we have a rubric of personal best, and that means the everybody, even all of you, if you had time, I could take you back on the trampoline and you could do some beautiful dives <laughs> off of it. Um, we really believe that people want to fly and can fly and that whether, and I think we have the Pick. sort of mm -hmm. golden seed to figure out how to eliminate obesity or to at least bring in um, the every person. So the body type doesn't matter, the age mm -hmm. doesn't matter. It's about um, developing with them an inquiry system so they would invent their own way to fly, they'd invent maybe their equipment, we would include everyone that Ruth led us to, since we don't know the kids here. But we have 700 kids at SLAM, and they come in every day, and they go from age 18 months to well over 50 or 60. Let's take a look at some pictures. Maybe you can help Is, us are out. Are these the SLAM pictures? These are some of the SLAM pictures, yeah. yeah. 
And, and I just want you to know that this is a garage that you all are always invited. We inaugurated the idea of a public space. Let's figure out how to put circus, streb, extreme action, and kids action all in the same vestibule mm -hmm. and have people be curious about walking in. And the first thing we, we asked is, what do we have? What's relevant mm -hmm. to the every person walking by our garage? And what might that be? And I first deciphered that it was our drinking fountains and our bathrooms. Because yeah. <laughs> in New York City, no yeah. one has public bathrooms or drinking fountains. And when the first Con Ed guy walked in and didn't read my meter, but went into the bathroom, I was like, yes. Um, and, and it's the thing about the instructing the children is that they're, they're asking their own questions. It's a respectful system, but it's a rigorous system. So they're figuring out, basically, don't always be right side up, go faster than you went yesterday, try and figure out what's a move that no one has done, what piece of equipment, like a musical instrument, could enable that next move. And it's about discovery and not thinking of something beforehand. It's something that occurs to you because you're in such a wild and crazy situation that you have invented by your own sets of questions. And I think the kids really teach us. One of the um, things I know is, is, yes, I'm sorry, what is so inspiring about Elizabeth and for us so perfect to work with her in Paris, is that she embodies, you can see, absolutely the perfection of the world-class artist, that everything is about innovation and discovery, but she also has a complete um, um, depth of inclusion that every single person, as you've heard, whatever age, whatever ability, can come on the journey and discover their own creativity, their own innovation, their own talent. And that's perfect for us as we build up to opening our theater in 19. So we'll be working here in Paris, finding those spaces in the banlieue and in the far-reaching arrondissement of Paris, so in the outer parts of Paris, where we can work with partners and communities who perhaps have never ever been to our theater in the center of Paris, and get them to develop their own skills to make a show with world-class artists from all over the world. It's such an exciting journey for us to start today. Yes. One so of the things exciting. you said at the Collaborate Europe Festival was, there's never been a greater need for local voices to be heard and understood. And talking about bringing people in who have not normally been involved in this world. A, why do you think it's, I think the understood part is very key there. And how do you, um, how are you planning to go about making them feel comfortable to come in and be part of this world that maybe they've never experienced before? Well, as Elizabeth <coughs> says, you start in their neighborhood. So you start in buildings that are familiar and friendly. You start where they are the experts. And you start by listening and developing their talent and their voices. And that's a process that we can do over the next two years. So that's a serious process of listening. I mean, and I think we should be inspired by, as, as our mayor, as Madame Hidalgo said earlier, the importance of listening and being the champions of the local voices, but also understanding and appreciating global impact. And artists have a role, as we've tried to explain today, to show the world, to share with the world, to talk to the world, to show how innovation can work in practice. We're both extremely innovative as artists, but we're incredibly practical. You know, we're about changing lives one at a time through the inspiration we give, as well as shaping and representing whole communities. Um, uh, could I make a comment about, about the building? Because I think that it has to be an attraction, not a promotion. Mm. Or even when we, and we, we're having these conversations all the time. So our idea about this garage, which was a mustard seed factory, was it didn't have the stigma of fanciness, yeah. which often just makes people balk before they walk in. There's these invisible signals mm -hmm. in some public spaces that are either inviting people in and or not. And it's not programs, and it's not, it's the fabric of the building. It's all of the activities, I think, that have happened and seeped into the bricks and mortar before we ever walked in. It's something maybe even, you know, work a day like people making vinegar or um, mustard. And I think that we believe from the experiment over the last 15 years with SLAM, and there's all graffiti on the building outside, and now we're locked in the middle of a massive condo build, because it's, of course, very, very high-end now, 
and we were the ugly. I just tell the taxi cab driver, I'm the ugl ugliest building on the block, and they have always know where to stop. <laughs> but the beauty of that is, is so profound that people walking by feel okay to walk in. And mm -hmm. that's sort of the beginning. They think, hey, it's, it's mine. I don't have to be careful of this real estate. I but think that's important. I think it's absolutely vital. And it's, it's really a challenge in a town with, with such history showing in its buildings. But one way around it, of course, which you're brilliant at, uh, is to use public space. And that's an area also where Bloomberg Philanthropy have done some exceptional yeah. work and where we were lucky to do work during the London 2012 Games yeah. to use those public spaces where you can find a public that comes because it's their space. You know, if it's a town square or a park, it's a neutral space. But also they can see work for free. And that's a really important barrier that we have to consider. And they can see really innovative work for free, really complex work people will rise to the standards that you show them. So one of our great opportunities is whilst our theatre is closed, we can go out and start finding new spaces, public spaces, both real spaces but also digital spaces where we can reach out and start involving new audiences and new communities. I'm going to ask one more question and we'll get a question from the mm -hmm. audience. I know that you planned, when we're speaking about spaces, that if you go over and you see the theater now, which is under construction, you realize there is an opportunity to use the outside space around it to be inviting in, as well as to use parts of the theater itself which aren't traditionally used. Tell us a little bit about your plans to do that. Well, um, underneath the Théâtre du Châtelet, we have the most popular metro station in the whole of Paris. Châtelet, the metro station, gets more than a million people going through it every single day. So one of our goals is to make sure that all of those people, how can we make sure that all of those people understand that the reason that Châtelet metro station is called Châtelet is because there's a very beautiful theatre above it. So we want to start by engaging people in the metro. That's a really, really great place to start. And then we have a beautiful square uh, we're right by the river. That's another fantastic venue. Could we walk on water, maybe? This is the time. <laughs> I've, been the time. I've been waiting. I've been waiting. now. <laughs> and this is how the creative process always starts with Elizabeth. <laughs> you start with something completely impossible, yeah. and then we make it happen. <laughs> I know. No, I can do that. Do we have, we have a question from the audience here. Hi, thank you so much. Martin Barry from Recite in Prague. And the question is, is about how does an arts organization get a building and how is it done in a transparent way? Because I think there's a lot of interest from uh, the nonprofit sector, the arts and culture sector to do something like what you've done. Uh, but it also needs to be done in a transparent way from the city's perspective or from the private sector perspective. So how is that done in your case? Um, Kate, do you want to respond to that? No, she won't. What you if, have okay. to. <laughs> she won't. Okay. Um, <laughs> Okay, so from the artist's point of view, the worm's eye point of view, um, we, I, I got a 10-year lease, short story, I got a 10-year lease from the uh, old Dutch mustard uh, man who owned the whole block. And then, you know, cut forward six years, Doug Steiner, the developer in New York City, who does, um, you know, lots of buildings, bought the entire block and started building the um, condo, condo project. I had six years left on my lease, and I was in his way. And maybe the circumstance of that is not critical to our, our amazing fortune, but I, I made friends with Doug Steiner, and we liked each other. It was snakes in the grass. We wandered around, and our <laughs> eyes met, and we were like, wow, you're cool. And I never thought as an artist mm -hmm. I'd be having conversations with a developer, and I was like, please sell me the building, please sell me the building. And then um, he loved what we did at SLAM, and he loved the idea. And so he said, finally, you know, I'll, I'll sell you the building for 1.3 million land value. I didn't have any money, so I rapidly went to the Department of Cultural Affairs and talked to Kate, then the commissioner of the Department of Cultural Affairs, and also Susan Chin, the head of capital. And it was this beautiful moment when Susan said, Is what, are you saying that you want us to it was time sensitive, I had to have it right away. Are you saying that you want us to give you a million dollars? And then I thought that was a trick question. <laughs> <laughs> but I paused, so I wasn't too greedy, and, and I said yes. 
And the great thing about that is the, the policy lessons from that, I would say, is when you have a city, a mayor's department, who understand the value of an artist, the way they can make a difference locally and for the city as a whole, when you see that there's a, a, a planning gain, there's an opportunity that you as a city can grab, you can see the benefits over decades, actually, that will flow from that. And many of you have got very sophisticated and brilliant policies exactly like that in place. And Elizabeth is a good example of what you get. I think you ladies have made a great case for art. Time out, perfect cities. timing. Please thank our guests. Thank you.